Now let's talk about the strategic considerations to make as a new final expense telesales agent. So this is where we get into some of the strategy, some of the stuff that new agents are ignorant about. And I mean that with all due respect. I'm not trying to insult anybody, but we are uh, relieving your ignorance actively, hopefully today on our presentation. The point here is we don't want you to make a mistake when joining an agency and thinking it's one thing and then it's totally something different, right? You need to be well informed on how this business works to make good decisions about your career. And so hopefully we will empower you that with what you're about to see. So let's first start off with how to pick a great agency to partner with for life. And the way to look at this is to look at it like a marriage, right? I hopefully you want to be married for life and the spouse that you pick, you want to make sure as much as you can, nothing's perfect, but you want to pick as much as you can that a, a, a keeper. Because part of the problem in this business that agents cause problems onto themselves is they don't do a good job of doing and picking a good agency partner and they bounce around a lot. I did early on. It has an impact on your closing, your commissions, your carrier availability, and your production suffers because of it. So we want to avoid that. So here's what you need to look for when you're doing your due diligence on agencies, who to join. Evidence of success. It's not enough to say, my agency is the best. That's what they all say. You need to go a step further. You need to look at case studies, testimonials. For example, um, shameless plug. In our website, we have dozens of testimonials and dozens of case studies of in-depth analysis on multiple agents who have written a lot of production and final expense telesales with us. Why? Because I want to have a preponderance of proof that you can believe in that we know what we're doing and we're a good agency to join. But if you find agencies out there, like there's agencies out there that have websites, they don't have a single testimonial, you don't even know who the owner is. It's like, why should I trust this person with my livelihood? Okay. Again, I like a preponderance of proof. If I'm going to do anything, I want to make sure that people like believe it and uh, there's enough testimony uh, saying that what I heard from the recruiter actually is true. Also, can you reach out and talk to active agents to discuss their experience with them? This is really important. I've always told agents you should ask for three references before you join any agency, even mine. And when somebody asks us, we will happily give you the name of three different agents, uh, usually just an email, where you can email them and say, hey, I'm a new agent potential. I just wanted to t ask a few questions see what your experience has been with the big agency. And then I don't want to get in between that conversation. They can have it privately uh, because I want them to vet us. I want them to make sure that what I said and what our team said is true in the experience of the agent. And then I want the agent to tell them the good, bad, and the ugly too. But what's good about the business, what's bad about the business, et cetera. Because we don't want to bring in an agent that, you know, just, man, it's just not a good fit and it wastes all of our time. It takes up a lot of mental space, right? So have you should have the ability to reach out and talk to active agents to discuss your experience. I think when you do that, you're going to find that it's going to be more successful for you and you're going to eliminate problems uh, up front a lot. Also, there should be a commitment to transparency, uh, transparency about what to expect, how onboarding works, who's a good fit, who isn't a good fit. Uh, sometimes it annoys the people who are looking to join our agency that we require to watch these videos and come to a Q&A call and then interview with us after they apply and then maybe do a second application before they interview and then wait on us. But we do all this because we want to be transparent, have multiple checkpoints along the way that what we do is a good fit because nothing upsets us and the team more than bringing on a person that, well, I didn't know I had to buy leads. That usually doesn't happen with us, but I didn't know I this or that was going to happen because it's just frustrating. It's a lot of wasted man hours, right? So commission transparency, it should be clear what commissions are, what you, you can expect to get paid, generally speaking, for the products and services that you'll be writing. The expectations, you know, you need to do this by this date. Uh, you need to perform at this rate uh, for X amount of time to be considered for promotion. Or if you don't perform, we'll let you go. The more transparency around expectations, the better. And communication transparency is really important too. This this is a big one. This is a big one. And we all suffer from this to various extent, but I'm huge on this. A lot of problems, just like marriage, can be solved if you just communicate with your partner, right? In business, if you communicate your problems early on uh, with your, your, your agent or your agency, uh, a lot of the problems that would have manifest go away. 
But a lot of people that I've seen, many agency owners ignore problems. They're not good at communicating in a timely manner via email, text, phone, Slack, etc. You want to have a commitment to communication. There's no perfect agency. We're not perfect for sure. Uh, but we are committed to when there's a problem, fixing it and communicating uh, what the solution is going to be for our people. And having that in place is really, really important. Good agencies also have a proven lead program. You only want to join an agency that has a proven lead program that many active agents are currently using. Don't be a guinea pig, okay? Uh, there was an agency in the annuity space. He wanted to try out a brand new lead program that was completely unproven. He wanted my thoughts on it. I, th I, thought, I told him, I th you're insane. Why would you take something that you don't know is going to work or not and then ask people to put their money up for it? Like, you have to protect them. You're, you're almost like their advisor, right, to the agents. And you want to put them in a position where they're safe. There's no guarantees in life. But the nice thing with what we do is, hey, in our free lead program, for example, all of our agents are using the same system. We can show you evidence of success. And it's not just one guy is doing it. Like, look at all these people who are writing all this business. There must be a high chance that it would work for you too. So you should be able to see that and it should be proven and shown by the agency you're looking to join. Training. Examples of excellent training that good agencies provide include personal mentorship. Do you get one-on-one -on -one training in some form from your trainer? That should be absolutely required. Are there foundational resources like sales scripts, underwriting guides, opportunities for meetings, and video training tutorials? You should have a con combination of all of this. Resources that you can a la carte and review on your own, and you're not always necessarily dependent on one person to provide it to you on demand. Another thing here is be wearing the fine print. And the typical contract issues that final expense and telesales agents face. So this is another strategic consideration that Man, it's just, it is so important to understand getting into it. So many agents get screwed and shorthanded because they don't understand the business arrangements that are unique to the insurance final expense space um, and then get stuck in, in, in what they thought were opportunities, which are just like anchors attached to your neck. Okay, so let's talk about line of authority contracts. What is this? So a line of authority uh, contract or a license only agent uh, is another way to say it, is a contract that says that the agency is going to pay you not the carrier okay so in in a non we call it a vested not vested excuse me in a a position of where your a normal contract works is that when you write a piece of business the company pays you okay meaning the carrier but with an loa contract what that means is that you will be paid by the agency and it's not necessarily bad but what happens is is that now you're in a position where the agency is in control of your money. You usually don't own the book of business either, meaning you're not, if you quit and you're owed maybe the back-end commission that you weren't advanced, you won't be paid that. And again, it's not bad. In most cases, with most structures, it's not a good thing. But you need to understand if you're in a position with an LOA contract, you might not ever own your business. You might not ever take all the commission that you closed based off of how that contract is designed. So again, what's the pros of it? I don't know if there's necessarily any pros uh, to the way it's designed. Um, it's more of a pro to the agency in order to manipulate commission levels in a more, uh, in a way that's more advantageous to the agency. But to the agent, I don't think there's really any pros. I wouldn't say it's ne necessarily inherently negative, but in many cases it is bad because the agent doesn't understand how the LOA contract plays in the long term. Um, they don't understand they're going to lose their commissions if they quit. And they find all this stuff out after the fact. So it becomes negative because they weren't informed up front. Unreasonably low commission levels. This is another thing to be worried about. Um, how to tell if commission levels are offered are unreasonably low. Uh, I, I'm arbitrary about this. Anything under 70% and you're buying your own leads is usually not a good deal. Um, commission levels where you're paid an hourly wage. That, that doesn't really have to be bad in a small commission. I wouldn't recommend it. I prefer a straight commission, but lower, like or a little higher, 30 to 50%. Um, these are the ones you got to be worried about. Generally speaking, if you're buying leads, and this is where this is of most concern because you got to control for the costs, 90 to 100% is kind of where I'd want you to be as a minimum amount. Okay. 
Another thing to be concerned about, no ownership of business or future renewals. Vesting is what this means. So it's who owns the book of business. Uh, and there are agencies out there, guys, where you don't own your book of business, even though you're buying the leads. And if you leave, all those commissions get rolled up to and earned by the upline. So there's a very uh, big organization out there that requires its agents, and they're on YouTube, uh, actually a pretty good channel. But the way their company works, if you look at the contract, you don't own your business for two years. Now, in this model, it's a little less of a concern because there's free leads offered, but they also make you do the same thing when you buy your own leads. So I had an agent once who was going to move over to us and he was in one of these positions where he wrote all this business and they tried to terminate him about a month before the two-year vesting period was up. And he luckily contacted the company and worked a way around it, but he was going to lose, get this, $30,000 in future commissions because of trying to game the system on the agency side to terminate him early before the two-year provision was up, okay? So the short of it is, is that when you're not vested out the gate, you don't own your book of business. And usually by the time you find out about this, you're like, man, it's gonna cost me a lot to make a better move for myself, so I'm just gonna buckle down and, and figure things out. And ultimately what happens is a lot of these agents quit and they lose a lot of that back-end commission they would have otherwise earned. And again, where I see this as being the biggest problem on vesting, is when the agent is paying for the leads. They're paying for the leads, it's coming out of their pocket in some form or fashion, and they don't own their business either. I mean, that's kind of crazy. They're paying to get their business, but they don't own their business. That's where I have the problem with it. So what you lose if you're not vested, we cover that. Releasing, this is another provision you need to take a uh, consideration with and asking the agency you're looking to join. A release is a provision to move your carrier contracts to another agency. So there are times where your relationship with your agency just may not be a best fit for you. For example, I had an agent this morning, longtime agent. He shifted into Medicare. We don't really focus on Medicare as much, but we've had contracts over time. And he's making a strategic move to go to another organization that's like me, is completely focused, but on Medicare, whereas I'm focused on final expense. And the way my business works is that we grant the release. So we, I said, you know what? That's fine. Makes complete sense why you're doing this. Here's your release. And we started the release process. So that way he's not tied with us getting zero help or not as much help as he thinks he needs on the Medicare space and uh, is going to go be able to do business elsewhere and get the help and support and service that he needs. So the point is, is that as an agent, having the ability to get a release is a, an important plan B in order to make sure that you don't lose your ability to conduct your livelihood. Again, there are people that run large YouTube channels that are right now making good content that seem like they're great. That when you look at the contract, you cannot move the contracts for a number of times. They say so in their, in their contract. This one contract had a non-compete for five years, which to me is asinine. It's, it's unfor unenforceable now with the um, FTC rulings on non-competes, but still they won't release when you ask for them. Um, why? Because that's how they roll. And they make these videos about MLMs and how bad they are. And here they are preventing agents from doing business. Um, and look, sometimes a release, not giving a release is fine if the agent owes chargeback debt that they're not paying or there's some kind of resources invested in them. But you got to ask about this stuff because they usually don't tell you up front. And um, we've always been committed to releases because I'm, I'm committed to the agent. If you're not in a good fit here, I, I don't want to hold you back. That's kind of how I look at it. So that's why it's important. Another thing you need to consider is captive versus independent. So a captive agent typically is with one agency. And in most cases, it's one carrier with one agency. Whereas an independent agent, we'll get to that in a minute, uh, is, has many carriers and sometimes can be broken up with different agencies. But the, the main difference is it's a one carrier agent. That's how I would describe a captive agent in most cases. The pros to a captive agent is that it's easier to learn the final expense product. You get one product to learn, and all you do is spend your time learning that one product versus many. It simplifies, in a sense, the process. But the downside to me, and I'm biased, I believe it's, uh, not, a, it's not worth the pro of simplification, is that you lose a lot of sales capability. You don't have options like you do if you're an independent agent. You have to push one product. You're a product pusher. And that product isn't going to be the best in many circumstances. 
you're also opening yourself up to getting replaced and having the policy lapse more often because many times the policy price isn't very competitive. And many times somebody can swoop in behind you and offer a more competitive price. So incidentally, a lot of these organizations have lower first year persistency and the quality of business that stays on the books, which means less commission to you. So I'm not a fan of captive, although if you're just stuck on doing one carrier, you know, go do you is what I would say. Um, but I think for the vast majority of agents, you're better off having options so you don't have to push product and you can get better price and coverage in place and keep more of your business and make more money, which is basically the pros of being an independent agent. And the cons of being an independent agent would be it's more complex. you got more moving parts, but most people can handle it. Um, it's very rare that somebody's so incapable of juggling multiple products that it becomes a detriment. It's usually a, a huge value add to the ability of writing business and making more money. And that's why I chose to be an independent agent. I didn't want to push product. I wanted to offer my clients options. And I recognized inherently that better options means better quality of business and that I'll keep more of what I sell and, and have more sales opportunities than if I had just one product that is not a good match all the time. Does it make sense? Hopefully it does. Let me grab some water here. <clears throat> Part-time versus full-time. This is another consideration you have to make uh, when you get into this business. Um, my story is, and this is the thing, because I the way I run my business is different than I start. I'll tell you why that's the case. I started part-time in this business face-to-face, uh, moved to full-time after six months, then failed out, and then started the second time again part-time for a year before going full-time permanently after that. Um, my story is unusually unique. Most people who fail out of the business never come back, and most people who start part-time don't succeed. And this is the observation I've had that most people don't do or have the same extent of commitment that I did. I mean, I had a full-time job at a Fortune 500 company, and I worked 30 hours a week selling final expense. I was never home. I worked every Saturday. I was only home Sundays because I was committed to not being poor and pulling myself out of the hole I created the second time around. And I did not want to work for the man long term. And I really meant it. I knew it was possible running your own business and being successful in this business. And I was absolutely committed. But I find that 99% of people aren't, unfortunately, because the, the demands of a full-time job are just there. It, and I just had a unique special situation that's just hard to duplicate. So for me and what we do, and I recommend is I recommend agents don't do part-time. It, it's, we don't take part-timers for telesales anymore because of this, because it just requires all of your attention to be successful. And that's true of anything in life. You can't half commit and expect amazing results. And the thing is, is you can't really even expect half results. You expect like a quarter or less results, which isn't enough to justify the effort anyway. So my advice to you guys, if you're going to do this business to make full, make full time work. And how do you make it work? You're going to have to take the leap of faith. Um, you're going to have to, you know, work every waking hour uh, doing this and then working in a part time job. You should make this your full time job and then find something else like Uber, waiting tables, side hustles, gigs, etc. to make up the, the to do the part time. You should be looking at this as the full-time and then do something part-time. And there's just no easy way around this, guys. I mean, I don't really have a perfect solution that's going to accommodate the part-time de desire. It's just something you, you really have to make work, uh, unfortunately. Telesales versus face-to-face, -face, another strategic uh, uh, consideration. Um, the pros to telesales is you never leave your house. It's also the cons of telesales. The walls are coming in on you. The close rates are a little lower, but the activity volume potential with telesales makes up for it. I mean, our top producers are all telesales now. Um, whereas the face-to-face -face pros are you close more of your business, but there's drive time, there's wear and tear to your car, there's time to get to your leads, unlike with telesales. And you're in some squirrely situations with some of the people that are out there. I mean, if you've seen some of the things I've seen and smelled, <laughs> you might just do telesales, right? So, um, you also have to consider what your personality type is. Some people are made to be on the phone. And I think more people are good for the phone now than ever before because of the training that we have and the carrier setups now. Um, and really the clients are acclimated to as well. 
Um, but if you don't like that face-to-face, -face, if you're a traditional belly-to-belly -belly person, face-to-face -face is great. It's still a great opportunity to sell. The industry trends, this would be 100% clear, 90% plus of the agents getting this business are towel sales now. I, I'm, I'm falling short of saying that face-to-face -face is like a legacy strategy, meaning like it's, it's like dying. Because the people who do it and really commit to it can do very well because there's less competition face to face, but um, the interest level is absolutely in telesales and and all the resources and the arrangement around the business and final expenses is oriented towards telesales. And the advantage of telesales, in my opinion, it, it way easier to do free lead programs if you're looking for a free lead program to accommodate for the agent. Um, you never have to leave your house. You're with your family more often than you think. And um, you don't have a huge expense with driving around in your car that you would if you're face to face. And you never have to step into this, these questionable circumstances, you know. And if you're worried about that, what's the worst they can do on telesales? Just yell at you, you know. Ideal carrier lineup. So let's talk about some, some factors strategically you need to consider when you're looking at carriers for final expense. Again, we talked briefly already about the one versus many strategy. I'm a big fan of the one versus the, I'm a big fan of the many strategy. You have three to five carriers to start with versus one. One product is not enough to do well in a, with this business. You'll pass up on sales, you'll lose deals, and you won't make as much money. So my advice is to have three to five carriers that are both good on pricing, flexible on underwriting, and at least one guaranteed issue carrier that will take anything you get of it because health is bad. Uh, you want a smooth signature process, um, verbal or text to sign for telesales. So um, don't depend on DocuSign, terrible idea. You want to be able to verbally sign along with your client verbally signing on the phone or better yet, I think is superior, a text to sign option where you get a signature process texted to the client. If you're doing telesales and you're getting Facebook leads, they all have cell phones, they all text. They can do those pretty, pretty simply. And they sign with a unique text signature and that acts as a signature. Uh, it's very simple to do. Um, it's You want to use one or the others. Um, Verbal is a little bit more lengthier, but it does work well. But stay away from DocuSign, not a good idea. Or a signature process that requires the client to get on the computer independent of signing it immediately with you. With your carriers, use carriers that have instant decisions, no exceptions. So there is one company and I'm refraining using companies uh, at this point in the presentation because things do change. But there's one company in mind that about half of the submissions for coverage would end up in a rate up or refer to underwriting or decline. And on the phone, cl your clients are fickle. They may be in a position where they're tired of being on the phone with you. They don't want to go through another application. It just seems like a huge time suck. And they'll just hang up. And why would you send half your business just to be declined or just not to get issued? Because that's ultimately what happens. So you don't want to use carriers like that. Instead, you want to use carriers that that the vast majority of the time give a decision immediately, okay? That even if it's declined, you find that out and you can pivot to another carrier. You don't want that to be referred and sent somewhere else where it may or may not be approved. Use social security deposit billing as much as possible. Social security deposit billing is when you draft the money on the exact date that your client gets his or her check from Uncle Sugar. So usually that's the first of the month, third of the month, or the second, third, or fourth of the month. Okay. So the reason we do that is that our clients sometimes like to take all their money out and forget that they've got a bill, they've got an auto draft from their account. So when we can line up that payment to the exact date in the early morning when that check hits, there's a higher likelihood we'll successfully collect the premium. So you want to use carriers that do social security deposit billing. I would say about 40 to 50% of the carriers do that now. So it is pretty normal. You want a guaranteed issue carrier that can cover uh, questions or clients without asking questions for bad, um, <clears throat> for clients with bad health. You want clients with approval rates or, or carriers with approval rates that are high meaning that you can dependably know that the client is going to get approved, kind of already referenced that earlier. The prices have to be competitive. You don't want to use carriers that have all mid-range or higher prices. You will get replaced in this business. You want to, you don't have to have the low price every time, but you need competitive, 50% or lower competitiveness all of the time uh, with your carriers. Because like, for example, one of our better carriers has a year-to-date 99% persistency on 541 applications, um, and, which means like the stuff sticks when it gets approved and the first payment is collected, 
okay? So that's how you keep business on the books is you just can't ever get it off of because it's so well-priced. And have a diversity of underwriting options, which you'll have by design if you have multiple carriers. Again, another strategic decision here. I don't think you guys, if you're going to get in the final expense tell sale, seriously, don't cross-sell. I got into cross-selling as an agent about six months in, cross-selling Medicare. And it just distracted from my final expense business. I didn't do well. I lost business during, during final expense. And that was part of the reason I failed. We also cross-selled at some point as an agency, or at least teaching agents how to do it, even though I gave them buffers of about six, 12 months. But what I found is, is that even good agents that get into cross-selling, most of them never succeed long-term. I can count on one hand, maybe one finger, <laughs> of uh, two, two agents in particular that cross-sold or worked from final expense to the Medicare that are still successful today. And this is over the past five years. It's just the failure rate of cross-selling is just, people make it sound out like it's really good, but cross-selling exponentially complicates the business. And most people are just better off selling one thing and being very good at one thing. And that's why we pivoted back to, and incidentally, like I said earlier, we had a year over year growth in our production of 325% thereabouts from, from April 2023 to April 2024 by just focusing on final expense. Lead strategy, how are you gonna do your leads? Should you buy them? Should you get your free leads? I bought my leads uh, on my own. It worked fine with me, although there are times when I got experimental. That was a part of the reason I failed out the first time. I created my own lead piece. It was a disaster. It got some sales, but not nearly as good as the tried and true method. Um, and, and yeah, but I handled leads okay. But my experience recruiting, as I've mentioned earlier, is that most agents struggle with buying leads. Um, they're emotional about it. Their spouse is emotional about it. That leads them to make bad decisions like skipping leads or buying other leads and getting away from the systemic or systematic approach that you should follow. Instead, it's probably better uh, because of that to consider, and because of entrepreneurial shock, is to consider buying your own leads, or I should say free leads, getting your free leads provided to you. So you don't have to worry about the entrepreneurial shock or the processes or the shortcomings of buying leads. Um, CRM software and equipment considerations. So a CRM is your customer relation management tool. It basically is what stores your leads, where you can call from, make notes, follow-ups, et cetera. You absolutely need to have one in telesales. You don't necessarily need one selling face-to-face, -face, but in telesales, it is non-negotiable, okay? I like anything that's go high level. We have our own custom tailored go high level dig agency CRM, which is fantastic for our agents. Um, but there are other options out there that are really good as well. Additional software needs, uh, you need a quoter like insurance toolkits or Best Plan Pro to quote and underwrite your clients. And then also, and I think this is non-negotiable, get Kixi. You need Kixi to help screen your leads better so they'll pick up and get more of your leads closed. Hardware needs, you need a modern PC. Guys, if you're operating off of something five years or older, it's probably gonna be a problem, so upgrade. Also consider getting a second, maybe even a third monitor. The more real estate screen space that you have to keep up your script, your uh, CRM, your carry applications, the better, the less uh, overwhelming it's gonna be. I recommend a direct connection to your computer, hardwired in from uh, your router, as opposed to wireless, because sometimes there are issues with that. And then a, a quality headset. Uh, make sure you test the headset out on the CRM and dialer that you're using to make sure that it comes through clearly. Long-term agency goal considerations. Um, should you build agencies? Should you consider building an agency? Um, the benefits are if, there, if there's a way to scale up the maximum amount of income in this business, it's through agency building. That's why I went this route. Um, it has been a great decision for me, but there are definitely drawbacks from it. If you do it too early, you're likely going to get distracted from making money selling, which is going to lower your overall income. And even when you do it later in your career, it's going to detract from you selling. So it's going to lower your income. And typically the agency building process is a multi-year process. So you won't see the return of that investment over the immediacy. It's going to take years. So don't give up on personal production if you're going to agency build. That's a big mistake. The other drawback to doing agency building, and this is part of the reason I like new guys doing it, is that you co-sign the advanced debt 
that your agents write. So if your agents lapse coverage and they don't pay it, you're paying it, okay? And there has been fraud that I've experienced in my agency where I've been left with $100,000 in chargeback debt, right? From just two or three agents, right? Within the last couple of years. And this is a risk that you carry with the upside reward being, you know, every month we have more than 200 agents now writing business and I keep a significant percentage for myself, although it's not the majority. It's significant spread out over hundreds of agents now. It's very, very lucrative in terms of income. And this is why I went the agency building route to focus on one product and not cross-selling for me is because the skill set was there for selling final expense and the trained people already know the product. So I don't have to learn something brand new and cross-sell and complicate matters. I can do what I do well and then teach others what I know how to do well. And for me, that's why I went that route to expand my income versus cross-selling.